This week we're talking about urban pollution and what makes a great city livable. The first thing that I would like to consider then is a definition of what is urban pollution. You can find many different definitions depending on the textbook that you look at and I've taken one here that I personally like from the chapter by Booth and Charlesworth in the book Urban Pollution. This is from their chapter one. And they define urban pollution as the presence or introduction of a contaminant material or energy into the built environment, either directly or indirectly, by either natural sources or, or and anthropogenic activities, and which are likely to have a harmful or poisonous effect on people, property, and or, or the environment. So that's a very broad reaching definition. On the right hand side, you can see a table taken from that same chapter. And this lists the top 10 polluted cities in the world, not a top 10 that you want to feature in. And it also lists the type of pollution. And if you look down through this list, you can see that there's a large number of uh, uh, industrial contaminants, coal, heavy metals, chromium, chemicals and metals. Chernobyl in Ukraine features are eight from radiation from the nuclear leak from the power plant. But in general, you can see a large number of uh, toxic chemicals here, which are heavily linked to industry in, in urban areas. So urban urbanization therefore leads to increased pollution from many sources. The top 10 is dominated by industry. Here in Sydney, we might expect that not to be such a, a major contributor with much of the industry moved out to the edges of the city. But in the inner city, there'll be potential pollutants such as traffic. Domestic heating can be a pollutant. People that use um, wood fire heaters, for example, in winter. Could be pollution from coal and oil combustion, from incinerators, from construction works, from road weathering and also from the sewage system if that leaks. A global figure taken from the Booth and Charleswood chapter is that these pollutants were responsible for 871,000 deaths in 2012. And that the three most important types of pollution are air pollution, so the air that we breathe, water pollution, the water we may use for recreation or for drinking purposes, and soil pollution which we may then take through gardening or through exposure to the soil. So why consider urban pollution? Well, firstly, and maybe most importantly, it's because a large number of the world's population lives in an urban area, and that number's increasing. If you're attending UNSW in Sydney, the chances are that you are living in an urban area. According to the United Nations, in 2017, 4 billion people, that's half of humanity, lived in cities. And that figure is expected to reach 6.5 billion by 2050. Here you can see the increase in the figures on the right hand side. So in the lower right hand side, I've taken some data from the Our World in Data website, which shows the share of population living in urban areas starting 10,000 years ago. So early in the Holocene, is, we don't really have figures from there going through to the modern day. And you can see this exponential increase. And in some parts of the world, such as Brazil, Canada, United States, more than 80% of the population is living in urban areas. You can see this expressed as a map in the top of the right hand side. This is the share of people living in urban area. This is data is taken from 2020. And again, it has a percentage and so you can see Australia is also relatively highly urbanized. And if we live together in close quarters in an urban area, and that increases the chance of us polluting the urban environment around us, then that could impact a city's livability. And that could be viewed as the city's ability to provide adequate conditions for the citizens, you and I, to thrive and have a good quality of life. And increased pollution affects city livability. 
So people will be less willing to engage in leisure activities in open spaces, for example, if the air pollution is too bad, or they will not be able to grow their vegetables, for example, if the soil contamination is too high, if they think this may affect their health. So livability is an important consideration. So that leads us to the second consideration of why urban pollution is important, and that is that it has direct impacts on human health. I'm going to take an example each from air, soil and water. And starting with air pollution and the picture on the top. Right hand side is a picture from Beijing, when I was visiting a few years ago now on a very smoggy and hot summer's day. Very poor visibility and very bad air pollution. And there was actually a warning not to go outside. So air pollution in particular includes fine particulates that can be inhaled. These are often reported as a PM10. And a PM10 is the particulate matter that's less than 10 micrometers in scale. You must, you'll also see reported PM2.5, which is less than 2.5 micrometers. And the smaller the particulate size, the more harmful they are because they can lodge deeper in your lungs and cause a health issue. And that's particularly important if the particles include toxic metals. And they can do because the sources of this fine particulate matter in the air often derive from industry, traffic and combustion sources. And these are associated with uh, heavy metals or toxic metals. And these can therefore be included in the particulates. You breathe them in and they can get lodged in your body with adverse health effects. Urban soils can also accumulate these particulates. So the air pollution, when the, when the particles settle, they then enter the soil profile, dominantly at the top, and they can bind onto organic minerals there and get stabilized in the soil. So the urban soils then accumulate these particulates and they accumulate these same toxic metals and sometimes organic molecules as well. And then when the soils are disturbed or used for garden products, these pollutants can be mobilized. They might be ingested through the vegetables that you grow in your garden, or they might be inhaled through the dust that you might disturb by disturbing the soil. And the third example, water pollution, uh, predominantly comes from discharges from industry and also from sewage systems. And that allows toxic metals, organic molecules and pathogens to enter water bodies, which could be rivers, lakes or, or groundwater. And causing a poor quality of water there, which may then affect us if we enter those water bodies. The picture on the bottom right is uh, an honours researcher, Amy McAllister, from a few years ago undertaking urban water quality research with Sydney Water as part of our honours project. And she's standing in the Toongabi Creek in Western Sydney. And Toongabi Creek is exposed to untreated sewage at times of very high rainfall when the sewage system can't cope with that. And so she's uh, removing an automatic logger from the river, wearing lots of uh, gloves and wetsuits to avoid exposure to the water there. And thirdly, urban pollution has impacts on the ecology, on urban ecosystems. Again, I have three examples for you. Uh, the first is using lichens and lichens as air quality indicators. And this has been a field of research for many, many decades, originating where people realised that lichens had disappeared from trees and from rock surfaces in the centre of large cities, and that this was probably due to air pollution. And those researchers worked out that it was the air pollution in particular from sulfur dioxide and these days nitrogen dioxide that can lead to a decline in lichen species in the urban areas. There are many regions sulfur dioxide and, nit and nitrogen dioxide concentrations have improved. So sulfur dioxide was largely from burning of fossil fuels which is decreased but nitrogen dioxide is from traffic and that's better but still not great. And lichens are now used as an air quality indicator. You can, uh, find scientific papers that are mapping air quality using lichens in many parts of the world. You also find in urban areas that you can have eutrophication, the nutrient enrichment of water bodies. Primar primarily, this is from treated and untreated wastewater from the sewage system, because even good quality treated wastewater will have, will have elevated organic matter and elevated nutrient concentrations. It's very hard to remove all of that. 
and that extra organic loading going into the rivers or lakes can lead to a decrease in the water quality, increase in nutrients and a loss of biodiversity. And aquatic invertebrates are now used and have been used for many years as indicators of water quality. And those of you interested in that, there are opportunities in the BIOS stream of courses with the School of Biological Earth and Environmental Sciences that will investigate that in more detail. The picture on the right hand side is taken from Centennial Parklands. It is one of the, the signs warning people not to enter the, the ponds there because blue green algae may be present in the pond. Contact should be avoided. And it says do not swim, do not let your pets in there, do not drink it. And it's a, that blue green algae is coming from the eutrophication of the water that's in the lake. There's too much nutrient, there's an algal bloom, and sometimes it can be toxic. The third example I'll give for urban impacts on ecosystems is the noise pollution effect on animal life. And the most researched area is bird songs. And if you want to go and do a literature search on the effects of noise on birds, you'll find that birds, some bird species might sing louder. That's so they can actually be louder than the traffic noise and the urban noise. Some sing at, at a higher pitch than they used to. So again, let's differentiate their song from the background noise from a city, which is generally lower pitched. And some birds have adapted to sing earlier in the day to avoid the urban noise and rush hour. So there's an ecological impact for birds as well. What's happening in class this week? Well, of the three different types of urban pollution, it's most practical to measure urban soil pollution. So this week there'll be a lab class where we'll analyze some urban soil samples. And the aim of this class is to introduce you to some of the analytical methods necessary for measuring polluted soils, to make analyses of some soil samples, and to understand how important it is to have good data management. And your learning outcomes will include the understanding of how to analyze the soil samples for different pollutants and, and how to manage that data so that it is collected suitably for subsequent interpretation, which is what we're going to be doing in subsequent weeks in the lab. Before the lab class this week, I would like you to read a chapter from the book on urban pollution by Suzanne Charlesworth and Colin Booth. And it's chapter five. Chapter five is the chapter on soil quality and policy. I only need you to read sections 5.1, 5.2 and 5.3. In addition, would you like to analyze the soil from your home or that of a family member or friend? If you do, please collect a soil sample. The instructions are given on the slide here. When collecting the sample, please use a trowel to scrape away any surface leaves before collecting the sample. Please only collect a soil sample with permission and please label the Ziploc bag with your name and the address where it was collected so that we have that information for the subsequent interpretation of the results. What do you need to understand? By reading chapter five, sections 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, .5 I'd like you then to use that information to understand what the soil pollutants are and their sources and what the consequences are of urban soil pollution for the categories heavy metals, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, polychlorinated biphenyls and dioxins. And it's heavy metals in particular that we're then going to get and consider in the lab class for the next few weeks.